Hello, and welcome to another edition of Brussels Sprouts. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Jim Townsend. And we're so glad you could join us. Throughout the month of January, Germany witnessed weeks of mass protests against the far right in numerous towns and cities across the country. The immediate trigger for these demonstrations was the revelation that leaders of the Alternative for Germany Party, or AFD, had met with neo-Nazis to discuss potential large-scale deportations of certain segments of the country's population. While the scale of participation in these protests demonstrates backlash among many Germans against the far right's xenophobic ideology, the AFD nonetheless retained significant popularity, particularly in Eastern Germany. As the country looks ahead to various regional elections this fall that could see the AFD come to power, as well as to national elections in 2025, how significant of a threat does the far right represent? To discuss the implications of the increasing mainstreaming of the far right, both in Germany and in Europe more broadly, we're really happy to have with us uh, back on the podcast, Liana Fix, and excited to welcome Erica Solomon. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, very brief uh, backgrounds and bios. Liana Fix is a fellow for Europe at the Council of Foreign Relations, and Erica is the Berlin correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, Erica, uh, you're there in Berlin, and so I thought I would uh, start with you and just a very broad question, kind of setting the scene and getting listeners up to speed. Can you describe the recent uptick in support for the AFD? I mean, the party has been around for some time, but why are we seeing the rising support? Yeah, I think it's been sort of a, a long time in the making, but you can in some ways uh, take it back to where we were when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and it triggered all kinds of um, fallout for Europe. And most importantly um, for Germany was the energy crisis. R uh, Germany used to be extremely dependent on Russian gas, cheap Russian gas for its economy. So not only what, was it facing an actual energy crisis, but also an economic crisis. And that is increasingly getting worse. Germany is, has one of the worst performing economies right now in Europe. And so it kind of there were material risks, but even more than that, there was, I think, a sense among many Germans of just anxiety and fear and a sense that uh, that sort of idea of of the your younger generation, your children doing better than you no longer applied. There's just a kind of dread feeling among a lot of people. And so slowly, at the same time, we also started seeing an uptick again in, in immigration, irregular immigration in, after uh, the sort of coronavirus lockdown had eased. And so that happened at the same time. Anti-immigration has always been a major boon for um, the far right. And that came at the same time that we saw a large influx of Ukrainians who were fleeing the war in Ukraine. And that just kind of overwhelmed the system in countries like Germany. And um, But most of the sort of uh, public blame that you saw being placed um, for this the draining of, of infrastructure and resources um, was at least by the sort of the far right placed very much on the backs of um, undocumented immigration from Afga Afghanistan, Syria, and so on. Um, this is not to sort of play a blame game between <laughs> different types of refugees, but just to say it kind of recreated this uh, fear of, of that type of immigration. And that's always been a great driver for the far right. So all of these things were happening. And um, I think around last summer, we started to really notice that the polls were uh, rising for the AFD. And when I started going to sort of different sort of like pub events, um, I would see people who weren't there before and who said, yeah, I've never voted AFD. I'm coming to check this out. And now what we are seeing is that has uh, developed into a situation where in some polls, up to 20 percent of the population has said they're considering voting for the AFD. Even in Western Germany, where it was never a, a very popular party, it's now in both the central state of Hesse and in the southern state of Bavaria, the second strongest party, and which is still, you know, it's a parliamentary system. That's not a lot. We're talking 18 percent or so. But it, it's symbolic. It means something. And it's worrying for a lot of Germans. Yana, maybe you can pick up on that. Feel free to add anything. But I did want to add uh, or talk about the regional variation. So obviously, Eastern Germany has been kind of the stronghold. But it is really notable, as Erica was talking about, the way that they're seeing increasing support also in parts of West Germany. So maybe you can talk a little bit about why 
this kind of has been an Eastern Germany phenomenon and what explains its growing appeal in parts of the West. Yeah, absolutely. So in East Germany, there's a long tradition, basically, well, since reunification of some kind of protest vote, because, I mean, obviously, reunification has been very difficult for East Germany to go through. There has been a lot of economic decline. So for a long time, it was the left Die Linke party, which has dominated politics in East Germany and was the protest party for those voters. And the left is pretty much um, followed up now by the AFD, because after years of the left being in power, East Germans don't really see a change and they're looking for an alternative and they find the alternative in the AFD. It's interesting that East Germany actually has the lowest numbers of migrants at all in the entire um, in, the, in, in entire Germany. So it is not really an immediate reflection of a situation which is experienced with migration on the ground. And then if we look to other parts of Germany, it is really the south of Germany, especially Bavaria, where the AFD um, has become strong. Um, Bavaria also has its own populist parties, the free voters, which are kind of between the conservatives and the AFD. So this is something where the AFD tries to squeeze in into a space which is a little bit more open than it was in, in, in northern and, and western Germany. And what comes to that is a kind of, especially since last summer, as Erika said, when the polls really rose to 20 percent, is also a lot of dissatisfaction with the current um, governing coalition. So we have for the first time a traffic light coalition, which means in the German context, social democrats, green and liberals, which really are behaving as if someone have forced them to be in a coalition <laughs> and as if they are the opposition to each other and trying to score points against each other. So the kind of statecraft that they have been doing, both in economic terms, both in transformational terms, they had a very ambitious reform agenda, has really been... Um, has, 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 has really, I mean, it has not failed, but it has stumbled so often that many people have lost trust in this coalition and in Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And this corresponds with the rise of the AFD to 20%. So if you check the AFD voters, half of those 20% usually say that they would still be open to vote for other parties. So it's not that these 20% are really sort of core AFD voters, Half of them are protest votes that you can get back, but half of them are really sort of a consolidated right wing um, extremist extremist views. And the problem for the future is, let me end with this, is that Germany has become a multi-party system and more of a multi-party system than it has been in the past. So it means that now Germany cannot be governed by only two parties. You always need three parties or you need a big coalition of the social democrats and the christian dem uh, of the social democrats and the christian democrats and that kind of leaves a feeling of um uh, as merkel had said there's no alternative right <laughs> so it really leaves a feeling well wherever i place my vote in the end i will always get the same result because of these coalition dynamics and that is something which will be difficult to uh, sort of for German politics in the future to make clear what are the alternatives. It's reassuring that the Christian Democrats under Friedrich Merz are still polling higher than the AFD. They're at 30 percent. So the conservatives are kind of coming back. Um, but then again, there's a question that the conservative leader Friedrich Merz has in some local context questioned the firewall with the AFD. So there is a question mark if he keeps the AFD as a power political option. I'll leave it. I'll leave it at there. Much more to say, but but that's yeah, for well, the I start. definitely want to come back to some of this, like uh, the the posture of other more mainstream parties towards these more extreme parties, because that's an important dynamic. But I think the thing that you were hitting on, Liana that's worth exploring a little bit is this fragmentation. And I know we're talking about the AFD, but as we were talking about before we hit record, it's not just the AFD, but there's the new far left party. There's a new party that splits, has spun off from the CDU. So I wonder if you both can talk about like what is driving this kind of splintering or fragmentation of politics? How much of this is um, a residual of, you know, having Angela Merkel in power for 18 years. Is this a reflection of really the disenchantment, discontent with the longstanding mainstream political parties? Like what, what is driving this fragmentation and why are we seeing the emergence of these newer and more extreme parties? I mean, I can try to, to give it an explanation, but looking, I'm curious to hear what, what Erica explains this. Um, 
one reason I do think is that Germany has gone through extreme crisis in the last year. So you had COVID and then you had the Ukraine war. And throughout these crises, um, there was very much one mainstream view which all party shared on how to deal with the crisis. So it was the same. All parties agreed on what to do with Corona and had basically more or less the same position apart from bickering a little bit. And all parties agree what to do in Ukraine, which is good on the one hand because it suggests a sort of a stable uh, middle ground and middle politics in Germany. But it left those who disagree with corona politics, who disagree with Ukraine support, with not many options left apart from sort of the extremes on the left and on the right on, on, on the right side. And those extremes um, uh, and, and the, the weakness of sort of this kind of um, a split within the CDU between the more liberal Merkel CDU and the more conservative Friedrich Merz CDU. I mean, let's remember that Friedrich Merz and Angela Merkel were basically enemies. I mean, she has forced him out of politics and this is his revenge now that he's coming back. That uh, many, uh, especially from the right wing spectrum, did not feel at home in the Merkel Conservative Party anymore. And therefore, we see this emergence on the right side. And on the left side, it is basically one person, Sarah Wagenknecht, who is splitting up from the um, from the left and driving a more conservative ag agenda, which also opposes, for example, Ukraine support. That's my try at it. But. Yeah, for a time, though, it did seem, especially with Corona, that like it was I mean, we did see a dip in support for a lot of the far right populist parties around that Corona period, because there was a general sense that it was the more mainstream parties with a lot of more political experience and navigating crises that were more effective in dealing with and navigating. So we did see this kind of drop in support. Angela Merkel, I think there was a rise for her support, and she really emerged as a competent leader of the crisis. So that, so that I mean, I, th I take your point about like the the too much consensus. And if people don't agree to it, they have, feel they have nowhere to go. But Erica, I wonder kind of what you see as driving the fragmentation. Yeah. I mean, just a, a couple of things I, I wanted to uh, add from, from what the two of you just said. Um, weirdly, the fragmentation uh, story is absolutely true. And, and I think it's probably something we would see in a lot of Europe. In fact, to the point that um, I was just recently in a meeting with my fellow European correspondents um, of the Times, and we were discussing, like, is the far right even the right term anymore solely because so much of um, of what they uh, espouse is being embraced by other parties, including like the CDU. So on the one hand, you have this fragmentation. And on the other hand, you have sort of everybody grabbing for each other's ideas. There's, it's almost like not just fragmentation in terms of more parties popping up, but like, what is the political spectrum now? What is it? What, who stands where on what policies and how are we different? And it seems like everyone is sort of trying to shift around and uh, navigate this change and not really sure anymore. And I think part of it for, at least for the conservatives, there's a bit of a crisis in terms of what is a conservative that isn't say, um, that is say, you know, loyal opposition or running the country regardless, um, that is um, not say branded as far right anymore or as, you know, pro-Trump, you know, in the case of the United States and so on. And so I think, um, you know, that's that's one element of this that's leading this fragmentation. I think people are trying to stake out new political identities in response to, I think, also a feeling that of what Liana was talking about, which is like a sense of kind of stagnation. Um, because of this idea of like no alternative, it seemed like all politics kind of ended up the same. And at the same time, having crises like um, Corona and then um, Ukraine and then the economy and so on. And so like, uh, I think these two things kind of triggered that fragmentation. But on the other hand, another weird thing that we are seeing is a sort of melding in other places. So um, the party that um, Liana mentioned um, from the that's come from the left by this sort of charismatic um, left wing figure, Sarah Wagenknecht, she's attracting voters from the AFD. And she's also using some of the same ideas that AFD uh, pol pol political leaders have used. And and so at the and we also saw this with the Corona protests. And I think in some way it all leads back there, which is when we saw hippie, lefty, anti-vaxxer types with far-right figures storming or trying to storm the German parliament, you know, in a sort of precursor to January 6th. And so, like, um, who are they and why are they together? That's not a usual thing. But in this new, crazy, shaken-up political 
uh, you know, sort of a spectrum that we have here that happens now. So fragmentation is happening in all kinds of strange ways. And I think we're still, we still don't know where everyone's going to land. Jim, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was that was confusing, but it was really very informative. And I just I'm going to have to untangle all of that. It's just great. But I kept thinking to myself. So what does this say for German leadership at a time like this in Europe uh, or in the transatlantic community? And I say that because um, if you're looking at this situation from the Kremlin, um, you must be pretty happy that you're seeing a lot of fragmentation, a lot of dissonance in a way. It's making it hard for Schultz to exert strong leadership, not just in Germany, but in Europe, too. Uh, and, um, and, in, in, and in concert with the United States, as we in the West try to have a united front uh, to facing uh, Russia and what's happening in Ukraine. And what could happen if Ukraine falters and then all eyes will go to Germany to try to, you know, lead a European effort to, you know, uh, to really stiffen resolve. And, and hopefully the U.S. will be part of that as well. But I think there's a lot that will be on Germany now and in the future in terms of European leadership. So so in, in your view, is this really making Germany and Schultz uh, just uh, unable to fill shoes in terms of German leadership? And it means Macron is kind of the, the default, is the French. Uh, the Brits are, have their own issues. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, what does this say about German leadership now and into the future? I mean, I would say this is to me almost too apologetic towards Olaf Scholz. I mean, because it's not just the context which makes it difficult for him to lead. He's just failing at leadership. I mean, it's <laughs> it sounds harsh, but that's how it is. I mean, he has a three-party coalition, he, which he's not holding together. He let them play out their um, their their problems in public. He pretends that he's a strong leader, but he acts in an arrogant way in the public. He doesn't explain what he's doing. Um, he doesn't um he doesn't admit mistakes. So his leadership problem is solely his own leadership problem. And it's sad because his idea was to continue in the footsteps of Angela Merkel, both in leading Europe and globally. And that's not what he's doing. I mean, what is saving him is basically the strong bond that he has with Joe Biden and the White House. I mean, they're on the same page with almost everything. So that is giving him some leverage. Um, but uh, the lack of leadership is is homemade. And I also would not say that it leaves Macron as the only one on the European stage, because although Macron has sort of reached out to Central Europeans more and more, and although he, especially with his recent remarks that troops in Ukraine cannot be ruled out, he's not particularly strong at home. Uh, he has is facing with Le Pen and Le Front National, or Le Rassemblement National, as they are called now. Um, he's facing a very strong populist right-wing movement, which has become normalized for so many years. And there is a legitimate a real chance that Marine Le Pen can become president of France one day. And then it's pretty much over with, with uh, French leadership in Europe. I mean, then the question is really how much of Europe is going to remain in place with Marie Le Pen. Erica? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I completely agree with what Liana was saying about leadership. I'm, I'm going to take it not from the domestic angle, but, but from a foreign policy angle. My conversations with leadership in Germany um, and other European leaders, it's, it's constantly made clear that Germany has made clear they don't want to be the leader. Um, and yet everybody wants Germany to be a leader. They, 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 it seems like, you know, especially in a post Merkel world, they seem like the natural leader for Europe. But but Schultz has said he doesn't want to do that. And very much he wants to sort of lean on the Americans and this transatlantic bond, as Leanna described it, to um, to sort of push through this leadership. And now what do we have happening? We have, you know, Trump making comments about whether or not he would let Russia attack NATO allies um, and so on. And so that's sort of shaken Europe and made them realize that all the talk that we've heard for many years now among European leaders about this idea of European sovereignty, that maybe they really need to um, to act on that. But I have to say, sort of pessimistically, I was at the Munich Security Conference um, a week ago. And of course, publicly, that's what you know, that's what all everyone is saying on the stages. Everyone's also talking about how we need to step up and get the weapons to Ukraine. And we know that if Ukraine crumbles, Europe is next. But 
at the same time, there's no clear willingness to change what everyone is doing. Um, Schultz has said, look, we are now, you know, after the United States, the biggest financial and military supporter of Ukraine, everyone else needs to do more. But then, you know, if you turn to the French and ask them, oh, okay, what are you doing? They say, well, but we've provided these missiles that Germany hasn't provided. And then Germany says, we don't want to provide the, the long range missiles that, you know, people want us to send because of risks that that could, you know, create for the war and so on. And so you see kind of Europe is stuck. They they know what the problem is. They've, you know, probably accurately assessed it, but don't seem to know how to get themselves out of it. And that's kind of what I was alluding to. I mean, Europe is stuck and you do hear a lot of, of wheel spinning <laughs> in a lot of different ways in Europe. And if the U.S. begins to disengage, whether it's because of Trump or it's because of uh, the China, you know, the distraction or whatever it might be, um, a, a Europe where there's uh, just this dissonance in terms of leadership and there's a lack of a country or a person that people can fall in behind or that can try to lead Europe out of the forest. If there's not someone like that. Uh, and the U.S., which has which can play a, a role like that, is not engaged. I would think that Putin would be really happy that he would. This would be certainly something to embolden him uh, if he follows European politics, which I'm sure he does. But the, he would look on this as a great opportunity to um, to to fulfill some of these warnings uh, that are coming out of European capitals that uh, if if Ukraine falters, uh, he could challenge NATO. I would think given what you all said, that this is something that would embolden him. Would you agree? I mean, there's also a question. I mean, of course it would embolden Putin, but there's also a general question. To what extent is it possible to have one leadership of Europe? I mean, that's what I'm sometimes asking myself because it's not that, I mean, Europe is not the United States, right? I mean, there has never been this kind of federalization process. And now that Britain, uh, Great Britain is out of the European Union, France and Germany have always been in some kind of rivalry, right? I mean, throughout history, obviously not the kind of rivalry that we've seen in World War I and World War II, but there is this tension about leadership in Europe, which is not going away. And we see this now between Scholz and Macron. And it was always the leadership of the United States, the institutions, EU and NATO, which have which has kind of tamed right. this competition for leadership. But these institutions that have tamed this are not there, are sort of crumbling too. So um, if you have powers that are equally strong in Europe and you have France and Germany, and then you can still think about, you know, Poland's ambitions and so on, it is really difficult for one country to say, oh, cool, we agree on Germany being the leader of Europe, especially if in so many areas they have completely conflicting views. And Macron's uh, speech just recently had made this clear. Everything from Eurobonds to um, how Ukraine is supported, as Erika said, um, there are different views between Germany and France. So I think it's it's a sort of American hope that there can be one leader of Europe, but I'm increasingly skeptical that this actually works in the European constellation. I don't know what, what Erika thinks. No, I, I mean, I agree. I, I think, you know, it, it seems like everyone is now asking, like there was this conversation, especially strong, I think last uh, autumn about, oh, well, maybe if Germany isn't the leader, maybe it's the Baltics or Eastern Europe, they can lead <laughs> Europe. But yeah, I think the that what you said is, I would agree. Like there, there is an issue that uh, there are inherent differences in the way a lot of these regions approach them. And I think, you know, without a, without sort of, yeah, the backbone of, of, of U.S. support of having Britain there and also a leader like, you know, like Angela Merkel, who was who wanted to sort of play a leadership role, um, then it's a little harder to kind of create this unified front. Europe is going to have to work harder. And again, it's like very frustrating because you hear all these leaders saying the right things, but but it doesn't come through in, in how they the decisions they finally take. Yeah, they um, the thing I want to talk about is the intersection between the Russia threat and domestic German politics. Um, mm. I thought it was quite interesting to see the German defense minister coming out and basically saying, you know, that Russia is not a threat now, but in a threat to NATO now, but in five to seven years, it could be. That was quite a bold statement, I thought, coming from the German defense minister. And then, of course, this week we had Macron coming out saying that NATO troops or European troops being sent to Ukraine isn't off the table. 
And so you have leaders at the high level kind of making these types of things, warning about Russia, identifying what it is that the West might need to do to support Ukraine. But then domestically within Germany, the AFD it supports an immediate ceasefire. So how do you think that that these high level statements making warnings about the threat that Russia poses is intersecting with the domestic politics and how are those types of statements being received by the German public? And I just want to add a couple of ways in which they already already have intersected in ways that I think are really worrisome. Um, so we've, we're talking about the IFD and, and the fact that they're getting more popular. What is also known about some members of the IFD, and we don't know yet how many or if it's just the aides versus the actual members of parliament, there are links to Russia already. There is an aide who is seen as having links with the FSB um, to an AFD member. There are other AFD members that I've been told by uh, fellow members of parliament they strongly suspect of of unusually strong ties to Russia, who are sitting on very sensitive policy committees, um, and and so we see this. We keep seeing this. There was a, there was the case of a, a mole in the German intelligence services last year, passing information to Russia. He also had links to the IFD that are being clarified right now in 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 a court case. Um, so there's all these these ways in terms of politics, and then you have the uh, infrastructure questions. Um, I'm going to put aside the Nord Stream 2, so the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipeline explosions because it genuinely looks like that might not have been Russia. But there have been a slew of other um, in incidents, I guess you could call them, with infrastructure cables being um, ruptured in inexplicable ways, um, uh, drones taking pictures of gas installations off of Norway, all of these things that, um, you know, I mean, we don't have access to what intelligence has gathered, but it's. I think it's clear that they have strong concerns about Russia involvement, not in all of them. And of course, it's easy to get afraid because you see all these things and you start to suspect a pattern. But in some of them, and given the context that we've all just been talking about, you know, I can understand why uh, Pistorius is making these comments. This is already what is happening now. What happens if and when there's a scenario where um, you know, Europe's, you know, support of Ukraine doesn't succeed or or that they start to see serious losses. So, you know, from 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 a defense minister's perspective in Germany, I think you'd have to be um, thinking about that and preparing for that. And the other, and like the question, though, which I mean, it's exactly related. So but 20 percent of German voters about support AFD, I guess that's I think that's what you said, where the polling stands. Does that mean that there's about 20 percent of Germans that would support immediate ceasefire in Ukraine or so like when the German defense minister is warning of these things, is it falling on deaf ears? Is it actually fueling support for parties that say that don't want war with Russia and who would rather make immediate concessions to end it? I mean, I guess so there's that bit of it. And the thing that I can't stop thinking about is if the U.S. aid and support doesn't come through and we do start to see Ukraine suffering some setbacks on the battlefield, do Germans want to lean in and do more to support? Or are they just going to be resigned and leaders in the AFD and other anti-Ukraine parties will be able to tell voters, see, we, we don't want to spend money on a losing proposition. I mean, is it, gonna, um, is it going to erode Germans to public support for Ukraine? I guess two yeah. related questions. Yeah. So there has just been a recent opinion poll by the European Council on Foreign Relations on some of these questions. And it is still the case that a majority of Germans support military support for Ukraine and support Ukraine regaining its territory. But it's not a huge majority. I don't have the exact numbers in mind, but there is a sizable part of the population that does think dialogue and negotiations, I mean, since dialogue, since uh, Ostpolitik and Willy Brandt always has this positive connotation in German politics, would be an alternative. So so far, the majority, the majority still holds. I do believe that if we would see Russia making advances, I mean, it will take time until they are able again to reach out far or we to reach out towards Kiev. I do think this could go two ways. I mean, this could lead to sort of some kind of resignation in Germany, but this could also lead to renewed resolve, right? I mean, because the argument that those make who don't want to support Ukraine anymore, they say, well, it's really just about these couple of regions that Russia wants. They will not try to overthrow Kiev. We have reached enough, right? But if there's another attempt to overthrow Kiev, I think that would that would wake everyone up. 
And this kind of shock moment is really what the chancellery is also banking on when it comes to Trump and to European security in general. So when you talk to them and you mentioned the comments by Pistorius, I mean, these comments are not backed up by action, right? I mean, there's a special um, there's a special fund which was invested. So Germany will get to 2% um, somehow um, by counting in the pensions of former GDR soldiers, for example. <laughs> so they're basically scrambling everything together. They can count as defense expenditures to reach 2% next year. But it's entirely unclear how 2% will be upheld once a special fund runs out. So, um, and there's no answer to that. And what you hear from the chancellor is, well, if there's a shock moment, for example, with the election of Trump, then we might have a situation where um, we can take radical steps, right? And I'm not sure if this waiting for a shock moment is really the right kind of preparation, especially against the backdrop of what, what Erika has been saying, um, that this context to Russia is strong. And Vladimir Putin always had a super soft spot for Russia, uh, for Germany, right? I mean, it's his favorite country. He spoke German in the German Bundestag. Um, and even if you listen to his speeches now, he very often singles out Germany. He singles out the AFD. He's very well informed about the AFD and about domestic politics, in Germany, and um, he is making jokes like, oh, I st obviously still have friends in Germany and their numbers are rising. So he's observing this very closely, the sort of intersection between domestic and foreign policy. And from his perspective, the Germany that he knows from his past is still alive. It's the Germany of the AFD and uh, of the others. And he's just waiting for this Germany to come back. And he expects that there's enough support for sort of the old Germany to come back one day, including Nord Stream, including uh, the Gerhard Schröder type of, of deals that were made with Russia. Yeah, I wanna, oh, yeah go please, Erica. Sorry, no, I just want to add on to what Liana said, because it. I agree with that. But I also think what's what's interesting, going back to the, the uh, polling numbers that you mentioned, Liana, uh, about support for the war, it's sort of this weird, interesting... <laughs> two sides of of the same german coin where you know also pistorius has been one of the most popular pop politicians in germany so you have the afd um doing so well in polls but you also have pistorius making these comments that we're talking about also performing extremely well so i think there is a, a strong sense in which germany germans are still a bit undecided and i think events will will shape that um, they're very, very concerned about what will happen in the United States, of course, not just in Ukraine. And so, um, yes, probably it would be better for Germans to come up with their own plan. But I do think that Schultz isn't wrong <laughs> to think that some kind of shock value might shift the conversation in one way or another. I want to talk about how Germans are perceiving the AFD. Um, I mean, obviously not the 20% that support them, but I guess what, you know, to return to the introduction and the anti-AFD protests, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and to see such public backlash against the party and some of the ideas that it represents. And so I guess, um, Erica, if you could talk a little bit about like how the AFD is seen perceived by non AFD supporters i mean is is it is do um do do other germans view the afd as a genuine threat to german democracy um and how much of that is shaped by germany's own past i think they do see it as a threat i don't think people are afraid that tomorrow their democracy is going to collapse but i think they think we we know something from history about democracies that are taken down by extremists who use that democracy to climb to power um and so um you know and, de and german democracy already called itself a, a defensive democracy they believed in this idea that maybe you should go further in limiting speech and um what certain parties or groups can do because you need to protect that democracy so already the basis for german democracy has a slightly different view than say in the united states but that said i think there is a genuine new worry Ironically, I don't think that the reasons that this this upsurge in, in, in protest against the AFD was actually anything new. It was sort of triggered by this article uh, by an investigative outlet that sh shone a light on what goes on at these meetings, which have, which have been many between extreme, extreme far right figures who propose this idea of remigration, which 
could controversially even include people, not the whole thing is controversial, but include people who are already German citizens. Um, and AFD members were present. So were members of the CDU. And I think this is an important point because this is what I'm getting to about like how in general you're seeing a shift in all parts of the population about these types of topics. But um, anyway, so so there was this report and I think it kind of was like woke people up. It, the, the idea, especially of, of, of deporting German citizens, even if it was hypothetical, even if allegedly these members hadn't signed on to that idea, they were listening. Um, you know, I think that really shook something in Germans and that that sort of triggered this going out into the streets, even though a lot of the things the IFD had done or its members had done, none of this was new. And, and even the IFD, their defense of this whole thing was, but none of this was a secret. We talked about this openly. And I think that really says a lot was that they were, they they really were talking about this openly. If you go back and scroll through their Twitter accounts and what they've said in parliament, it's not new, but the way that it was framed and the way that it kind of jolted people into realizing and looking at what this meant, that really brought people out onto the streets. Um, and I also think though that, um, that there are plenty of reasons why if you are an anti-AFD po political person right now in Germany, you would say you could have a strong argument that there is a real reason to be worried. Just two years ago, there was this plot, which was extremely outlandish and was not likely to have succeeded, but there was a plot of a group of conspiracy theorists who wanted to try and storm the violently storm the parliament and start a trigger a coup. And, um, and the person who brought them into parliament to scout out their mission was an AFD member. So, um, you know, that's just one of many examples of which AFD members pop up in these in these extreme sort of uh, plots and scenarios that have uh, repeatedly emerged in recent years in, in, in Germany. And so um, I think rightfully its critics say there's too much going on. There's too much smoke for there not to be a fire somewhere. But, um, you know, that said, the AFD always has its defense. Oh, but this was an aid or this was a that or this. And so, it's a it's a it's a shaky picture, but I think for the people who are skeptical of the AFD, it's it's clear enough. I don't know if I answered the whole part of your question. You can feel free to go back if there's something. Else. Oh, that was great, Jim. Jump in. Um, you know, I, I that was really very helpful. You guys are doing a wonderful job. Um, you know, if you're an American listening to Brussels sprouts, uh, and you're uh, you know, you don't follow Europe very closely, or, or maybe you do, and you're trying to learn about this. I think a lot of Americans will think of AFD in terms of, of equivalency in the U.S., and they'll go, well, that's, the, the AFD is like Trump. I mean, you know, they had their own, you know, kind of January 6th-like uh, event that didn't work out uh, quite like ours did. Uh, they'll look on the AFD view towards Ukraine uh, as similar to what is espoused in some of what Trump says, uh, but as we know, uh, there's no, there's really, uh, it's it's dangerous to make those kinds of comparisons between something that sounds like uh, Trump when it's a German, it's a, it's not a, it's not a German flavored Trump out there in Germany right now. The AFD isn't a, isn't a Trump flavored organization, or is it? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think one. One aspect that Americans always underestimate is the incredible soft power that the United States has in positive and negative terms. I mean, the soft power that they have exerted when it comes to Trump and the inspiration that so many movements across Europe have taken from Trump is just wild. I mean, it's just wild how everything from the United States sweeps over to Europe and becomes so powerful, right, and gains followers. So you cannot sort of make this the claim that there's, you know, a, a Trump in, in Germany. I mean, again, this is a very sort of US specific context. I mean, you have like a proper neo-Nazi in the AFD, Bjorn Hocker, you have others who try to conceal their radicalism. But the inspiration that is taken from events in, in the United States is very clear. And it's 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 very it's clearly there. What is interesting is that if you ask AFD voters, they say that they perceive the party as less radical and less extremist. So if you ask them, are they concerned about discussions that the AFD should be, as Erica said, 
um, should be uh, forbidden as a party, which is possible in Germany, right? You can say that this party should not um, legally exist anymore, especially since the youth organization is already deemed extremist by the German um, domestic intelligence services. Those 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 voters would say, well, 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 no, we don't see this party as that radical. And that's interesting that sort of in the self-conception of those who... Uh, who possibly could support the AFD, it seems less radical, whereas the actual prog progress that the AFD has been going through in recent years has been a path of radicalization, but really of right-wing extremist radicalization with very clearly, sometimes also neo-Nazi um, views, which there sort of differs to Trump, who is his own you know his own product of american of american politics and culture but clearly with the with the attempt at storming the german parliament has taken inspiration from the united states and these conspiracy theories i mean just to add because it's so funny i mean they basically claim that the Ger the germany doesn't exist since 1945 the federal republic since 1949 and they claim that there's still a german um a German sort of imperial state um, that there are no legal foundations. They don't send their kids to school. They have their own passports and their own driving licenses. So it's when I was sort of supporting election campaigns in Germany, I knocked at a door of one of those persons who actually explained to me in 30 minutes why she doesn't send her kids to school, why I shouldn't make any election, should support any election campaign because the state doesn't exist and this is all fake. Um, and that's that's pretty wild. I mean, there you see the intersection wow. between what Erika said. It's not only right wing in politics, it's really weird. <laughs> it's really weird. Although I just want to add, arguably, the Germans could say that the Americans copied them when it comes to story. <laughs> <laughs> because I think the the storming of the Bundes attempt happened before January 6th. But anyway. Uh... <laughs> A little more, Erica, um, on how um, how Germany, how Germans, how like th through the legislative means that they're trying to navigate what to do with the AFD. Um, yeah. I think that's.